The song we have just uh, sung certainly introduces what I would like to study with you a little while today. And you might also be turning at this point to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. What I'm interested in getting over is not anything new, but good to remember and good for us to exhort ourselves in our daily living as to what we are about in wearing the name Christian properly. We want to study about being a faithful servant of Christ. And in order to do that, and more specifically, one must have the mind of a servant. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if we would be a servant, and we all know the Bible talks about that, then we must have the mind of a servant. I would remind you of another familiar passage in Romans 6, 17, and 18, keeping in mind that letters written to Christians. They had obeyed the gospel. The Lord added them to the church. Now here's a letter to help them in certain things. And in doing so, it reminds them of what they did in becoming Christians to exhort them to greater service. The idea, remember, is service. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. The servant there is the bond slave. We do not belong to ourselves. We belong to the Lord. When you think of some of the things we've just sung about how God has done all these things for us and how he cared for us and loved us to the uttermost, then we belong to him. And we must, therefore, live the life of a servant. So this lesson is based on chapter 20 of the book of Matthew, verses 20 through 28. And thus, we're focusing on what it means to be a servant. I want to emphasize three things here that I hope to cover in the lesson. Number one, I've already mentioned, the attitude of the mindset of a servant. Number two, know what you need to do to serve. That we must know. As a member of the church, a Christian, a child of God, being a Christian, we're of Christ. Christ is the epitome, prime example of service. I came not to do my own will, but his that sent me. Thus, we must know what we need to do to serve him as he pleases. And then it just comes down to the third thing. You get busy about serving. You can study about these things all day long, but they must be put into practice before they're ever appreciated. So we want to ask, what does it mean to be a servant? And we'll emphasize that to be a servant then, one must have the attitude of a servant or a mindset of a servant, know what one needs to do to serve, and then to be busy about serving. Now, in effect, we haven't used this word yet, but this is what we're talking about. We're talking about discipleship. If you're a disciple of the Lord, then you're following Him. You're learning from Him. You're living as He teaches. You're looking at His pattern of life. You're simply following the way He lives. And then it's hoped that we'll be better off when we finish the sermon to understand more what we do all day long every day in being a servant. Now, concerning the text, Matthew 20 through 28, I'll not read it right now, but we'll look something... Uh, look into something about it. You'll remember that James and John's mother came to Jesus, and she came to ask him a favor. You see the humanity in these people. Here are people around Jesus every day, and yet they have a, a, a messed up concept of the kingdom and what it is to be a citizen of the kingdom. Thus, they don't understand what real service is. Because she wanted her sons to sit on the right hand and left hand of Jesus. And Jesus' response to her once she's made that request is that it's not his to give that. She didn't know, uh, they didn't know actually, what they were asking for. Because really we know now if you're going to be that close to the Lord in attitude in life, you're going to suffer a lot. And this brings up then what Paul said to Timothy, that if you're faithful, you're going to suffer. And we don't, we're not, I don't think any of us are really prepared for that, possibly because we've been so oriented to the freedom of religion in America. We haven't known what's happened in most of the world's history toward anybody that was faithful to God. 
and it involved a great deal of suffering to stay faithful to the Lord. But the Lord then explained that holding these positions um, involved things that were not, they were not really considering. It sounds good to request some things, but sometimes we have to say, well, really, what goes on with the territory if I'm going to occupy that position? And that's happened to a lot of people. I sure would like to be this, and I sure would like to be that, and my plans are to be this. But really, when you get into the position and start really discharging what's involved in that position, then you realize there's so many more details to it, and many of them are not that, not that easy and are not uh, pleasant sometimes. He then explained that this honor could only be given by the Father. Sometimes I think in the church when we're praying to be able to do this and to do that, and, and there's nothing wrong with it as long as what we're wanting to do is authorized by the Lord. Certainly not. But between wanting it, praying about it, desiring it, and actually getting into the position to do it, there be a lot of differences, a lot of things that come along, and we don't really realize sometimes what must take place to be able to do the job we say we want to do. Well, you can imagine how this set with the other ten apostles. Uh, it just made them angry because, remember, she says, I want you to do me a favor, which means that puts them aside and exalts my two sons, which shows you again the humanity of it all. Uh, but it made them angry. And Jesus explained that in the kingdom, it is not those who hold authority. Now, there's the problem. They wanted it. She wanted it for her sons because she could see them sitting on thrones of authority. It wasn't a matter of, of the washing of the feet, which is one great example he gave to show what it is to be a proper servant of the Lord. Uh, so who is chief? And that's what it comes down to. Who is chief among the Lord's people? And, of course, it comes back to what we all know. It's those who serve as the New Testament directs that service. It's doing right, as I often say, the Bible defines what's right. And sometimes that can be rather distasteful. Jesus himself came to serve. I don't need to say that. You know that already. So also Jesus' disciples must learn how to serve. But now the Jew had some of the same problems we've got. They saw the Messiah as a Solomon David together, and all they could see was triumph and power and might and throwing off their enemies by divine power. And, and there they were upheld in their splendor and glory above and beyond all of the peoples of the earth and a kingdom like the world had never seen. I wonder where it was, was it? So Jesus had to orient them the other direction. And we in the church, as Christians in service to God, must realize then that a whole lot of serving God faithfully is, it can be very unpleasant, be unpleasant, not appealing. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of attention. But if it's right as the Bible defines the right, then God gets the attention. That is, he, he sees us. He knows us. We get his attention in the right way. If we could just learn to measure, and I think we spend our lives trying to be faithful to God, understanding that, that we don't become great like the world defines greatness. We become great in a way the world ignores, the world despises, the world thinks is worthless. And when you read Paul's reasoning, you know, that which is foolishness to the world is what God exalts. So to be a servant, we must, as I said earlier, have the attitude, the mindset. We must think like a servant. And again, I say that this may be the greatest barrier in all that we want to be as a servant of Jesus Christ, a faithful servant of Christ. Now, one big barrier is that we don't live in a country that seeks to serve others. We live in a country that seeks to be served. Now, no less than the worldly John F. Kennedy in his inauguration recognized that. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That's a great, I don't care who said it, that's a great comment. You can apply that to the family. You can apply that to the school you're in. You can apply it to anything that you can think of. What is my part in this? What is my responsibility? It's not enough to say, well, uh, what 
it's James' responsibility. It's Andrew's responsibility. Well, it may be. Well, what's my responsibility? What am I to do to be faithful to God as a servant? What is he seeing about me? So this country says, no, promote. Uh, something that's up big, something with a lot of money, something that's a lot of fame. The only way you could have a Kardashian, or whatever their name is, be great would be something like that because I don't know anything in this about them that would make anything great. And that's the way the world thinks. So our culture is permeated with the message of serve me, serve me. And we have a difficult time understanding in our whole Western society, our culture, what it means to have the New Testament or the biblical attitude, mindset, outlook of a servant of God. And again, attitude plays the most important role in all we do, and especially in being faithful to Jesus Christ. So how do we develop? How do we develop the attitude or mindset of a servant? Starts out, and this is where the problem is. We need to consider others before self. I suggest to you that when you look around a lot of problems, brethren, you'll see that what their problem was, you're not considering me and letting me have my way and do what I want to do. And you will see where the root of a lot of problems we've witnessed has come from. It's not like I want it. And if it's not like I want it, somebody's going to suffer. And that's exactly what this world is suffering from. In Philippians 2, 3 through 4, God, by the Holy Spirit, through Christ and the great writer Paul said, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Now let that think sink in, folks. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Now think a little bit. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But now think about this. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And when you violate that, you see the root of a great many problems in the home, on the job, in the school, in the government, in all the society, and yes, in the church, and why there are so many members of the church that aren't servants except of themselves. Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, We then that are strong, meaning in the faith and your trust in God based on His Word, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. That is, those that aren't as knowledgeable of the Bible, aren't as strong because of their lack of knowledge or experience. But then look at the last part of this. And not to please ourselves. Whoop. You just knocked the American right off his pole. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. That means building up. For even Christ pleased not himself. But, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. What does that mean? What I should have gotten, what I should have received, the punishment that was due me, who took it on my behalf? He did. When we consider ourselves, then we need to consider ourselves unworthy of honor. I suggest to you one of the greatest positions and attitude in life to which you can arrive is forget about receiving honors. Just, just forget about it. Just go about doing what you know God says from an honest heart because you want to do good. And whether anybody ever acknowledges it or not, just do it. Now, that doesn't mean godly people don't want to give encouragement to people doing good, but I'm talking about the individual who goes about doing good. Just don't expect it. If you start expecting it, then if you don't watch out, you'll be doing it in order to receive it. But that's not why we do anything as faithful children of God. We do things as faithful children of God because it pleases God Almighty, whether anybody else knows it or not. In Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 11, you see an illustration. 
It's a proper attitude illustrated and an improper attitude. And here's what you have. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out of the chief rooms, saying to them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that hath bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have a worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. That last part of that is what I look at when I see a lot of folks saying, Look how great I am, and I have a right to walk all over you because you're nothing. You know what's going to happen to them? What did he say right here in this last, last one? For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. Now let me ask you this. Lord mean what he said and he say what he mean? Is it going to come to pass? Yes, it will. And he that humbles himself shall be what? Exalted. Now who is the person that humbles himself? The person who with meekness, submissive attitude, is happy to do God's will and be a servant of God. What anybody else does... Is their business. And if you could train and help them, you would. If you could teach and show them the way of a servant, you would. But you know that God's true to his word. And if you humbly obey his will, what will he do for you? He will exalt you in due season. Romans 12, 3, we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Have you ever sat down and thought about that? Well, what does that mean? Do you think very much of yourself? Well, there's a right thinking of yourself, and there's a wrong thinking of yourself. All of us should realize that we're worth so much it costs Jesus Christ his life on earth to save us. Even the Lord said that uh, your soul's worth more than all there is. How much would a man give in exchange for his soul? Yet at the same time, you don't position yourself or push yourself maybe that's a good word for it push ourselves up to say look at me uh, let me get to the front I want them all to see me I'm here to be noticed that won't work Romans 12 16 condescend to men of low estate and then notice be not wise in your own conceits your conceit is what you think of yourself that you think is pretty important and so we joke about it. Oh, you're conceited. My daddy used to have a pat thing that he did. He says, oh, I'm not pretty because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not conceited because I'm prettier than what I think I am. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good way to define it. <laughs> I'm not conceited because I'm prettier than what I think I am. Well, that's, that, I think that pretty well does it. Just apply it to other areas of life, and that's where a lot of people are. Well, what's he saying? Realize who you are. What have you got to boast about? So you have an intellect like Einstein. How does that compare to God? <laughs> so you have all kinds of opportunities. Are you willing to give them up to be faithful to God? It's just a matter of saying, I'm here on earth to find God with the best of my ability to serve Him, whatever He asks me to do. Why should I exalt myself and say, oh, what would the church do without me? Brother G.K. Wallace used to tell this talking about matters of expediency and, and options when it comes to the church doing things, especially about the building. He said, I go to a meeting and I see this very commodious building and a very useful building, very practical building for what the church is to do. And I'll get in the pulpit and say, I do not know how in the world y'all were able to do this without me. Well, of course, that makes a good point. Some of us have a high estimate of ourselves. But we should condescend them in a low estate. Realize God can get along about you. Well, where was the, what was God doing in the world long before you came here? Do you think he's going to be able to get along after you're gone? And besides that, not just God, what were the people doing before you ever got here? After all, to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity started a long time before any of us got here. Somebody had sense enough to do that. But how'd they do it without me? I just don't know. 
So we need not think that there is a task too lowly for us to accomplish. We just need to have the idea, let us accomplish it as the Bible directs it, and all will be well. Be happy to do what it is that God wants you to do. Be pleased with that. We need to look and learn from 2 Kings chapter 5, 11 through 13 of the account of Naaman, 2 Kings 5. Remember, Naaman thought pretty highly of himself. He was a leper, and I don't guess any of us grasp what that meant in those days. But he was a great man, except it says he was a leper. Well, of course, I won't go through the whole story, but when he finally got to the prophet who could cure him, the prophet didn't even come out and sit, look at him personally. He sent his messenger out, Gehazi, and told him to go dip seven times in the river Jordan. And it just upset him something ferociously. Now think about that for a minute. He came all that distance took all that time and the way they had to travel in those days into a country they didn't like anyway to come hear the prescription that would cleanse him of his leprosy. Then when he heard it, what did he do? He was angry because it didn't suit him. It didn't suit him. Well, I've seen people like that, and you have too. If you don't watch out, you've been that way. You hear something, well, I just, that just doesn't sit well with me at all. Okay. Go ahead and remain a leper. Nobody's going to fight you over it. <laughs> if that's the way you think, I just keep going. You, you, you came asking of me. If you're not willing to listen, go somewhere else. Well, he's going to leave a leper wherever you went. But you notice when things changed, he humbled himself. And by the way, we're talking about servants. Servants. Who was it that reasoned with him? A servant reasoned with him and said now if the prophet had bid you do some, do some great thing as the world defines great when you have done it well yes well, then how much is this dipping seven times the river Jordan so he got out off his high horse maybe literally <laughs> and he went down the river Jordan dipped seven times and he was cleansed so who was it that turned Naaman away from his haughtiness and his arrogance it was a servant that servant knew how to get along with his master, and so should we. So we need to take into account the principle of love before doing all things and what it really means to love. Paul wrote Galatians 5, 13 through 15, For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Well, one of the best ways not to bite and devour one another is try to serve one another. Try to be ready to help that other person. Now, we have to understand that help comes from the way the Lord says that help needs to be done. For example, Paul helped Peter when he was studying to the face. Peter helped the former sorcerer after his conversion as a babe in Christ when he withstood him and told him what he needed to do. Our concept of help must be that help fits the truth. We need the truth. If the truth rebukes us, then we need to embrace the truth and take the rebuke. Paul said, if I become your enemy, because I tell you the truth. That's a servant, too. In 1 John 3, 16 through 19, Marvel not, brethren, if the world hate you, we know that we've passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So how is it that I cannot hate? I don't want to hate my brother. Well, I'm going to have to love him. But how do I love somebody? We don't ever ask that question because it's so emotionally tied up. How do I love you? There's an old poem that says, How do I love you? Let me count the ways. There is a right way to love people. You don't love somebody if he's in sin and you don't show him the way out of sin. You don't love a sick person if he can't help himself in his sickness and you don't do for him what he cannot do for himself. And so on it goes. So we have to have the view that God knows best. Then we need to know that I need to serve. I need to know 
that I need to serve. I'll never be as happy as I'd like to be if I don't understand service. You won't do this unless you say, I'm going to get involved. I'm just going to get involved. I still say most elderships, and I said this a long time before I ever became an elder, most elderships would almost suffer a heart attack if somebody came up to them and said, is there something I can do? Do you have a work I can do? Uh, is there something around I don't realize that needs to be done? That just rarely happens. The old adage is true. The more you put into something, the more you get out of it. Now you know why many members of the church are miserable. A half-baked. They're not putting anything into it. And what they put into it is, I want it my way and I'll make you miserable if you don't get me. That's what they put into it. You just think about it. I'm asking you simply to call by common sense your recollection of people and things. There are some who want to work, but they don't know what they can do. To me, this is part of what we must do as older Christians and elders in particular, is showing people here are things you can do. Also, it means you don't give them something to do they're not able to do. To me, this also comes out in the idea of what deacons are supposed to be in view of their qualifications of the work. They need to know how to work through the church to be able to select people that can do certain things and not select people that don't know what they're doing. Many times it's due to lack of involvement then that people aren't happy. The more involved you are with something, the more opportunities will arise to serve. It just works that way. I don't think that's... Um, a profound statement, but it's just, it's just one that works that way. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, mess around with it. That's not what it says. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, ask Gary to do it. <laughs> and we will be asking you soon several days, Gary. So whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Put your all into it. Do the best job you can with it. And then involve others. To me, again, that's where deacons come in and view their qualifications and their work. They search out among the congregation people that can do certain things, and they know who can do it, and they know when to call on to do it. There are those who serve, and they want to do everything. Sometimes you have to say, no, wait a minute, you've got enough to do. Let's share some of this. Uh, there's not necessarily anything wrong with this attitude, but sometimes we need to involve others in the work instead of doing it all ourselves. That is a biggie. Because you know why we like to do it all ourselves? I don't have to fool around with the mess-ups you make and redo it. I'd just rather do it myself. But sometimes helping people grow means that you have to work with them when they're maybe making some messes out of it as they're trying. In Luke 5 and verse 7, and they beckoned unto their partners. Beckoned unto their partners. Which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now nobody did it by himself. I can't do it myself. Come help me. A lot of people in the church don't want to ask somebody to help them. Yet here it's obvious we can't get the job done with this boat. Let's ask our partners over here. And together, working together, we got the job done. Then, of course, as always, I can't emphasize the matter of praying too much. Brother Roy Deaver used to say, of course, it has to do if you know what a hoe is and hoeing a garden. He says, you pray at the end of a hoe handle. That is, you're hoeing that garden because you know what you do with the hoe and weeding and stirring up the ground and all of that. But then you're praying to God as if it had all depended on him and you're hoeing as if it all depended on you. So we ask and we pray. We learn who to ask. We learn who to encourage. We learn when we need to ask. There's always something that needs to be done. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Is there ever a time in the church, if you're what the church is, that there's not something that needs to be done? Around here, if you want to know something that needs to be done, always and every time, just think about the drains. If you want something to do, then just ask someone. And there's always something around here that needs to be draining. In Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given to you. <laughs> Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. But may I mind you, as we said many times, those are present tense verbs in the Greek, and it means don't stop asking and so on. Because sometimes the only way you get some people to help is when you worry them to death. Well, 
worry them to death to where they can know that they can do something and that it needs to be done. And they're the ones to do it. And they're not being faithful unless they do. We are, as the army of the Lord, a volunteer army. So we need to have that spirit as a servant of the Lord, as a soldier, a good soldier of the cross, to be ready to volunteer. But you've got to develop and grow to become that volunteer. Many times there are things that need to be done about which we don't need to ask. If you see something needs to be done, then you can just do it. I suggest you inform somebody about it. They'd like to know maybe it was done. But there's nothing wrong with seeing if, a, if something needs to be done, whatever, to make it work right because it usually works this way and it's not working that way, then stop and do it and say, well, I'll fix that and go on about your business. Galatians 6.10, as we therefore have opportunity. Now, you think of how we normally apply this. If we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Well, opportunities avail themselves not just in teaching the truth to others and defending the faith, but just keeping a plant like this going or just doing things wherever you are, neighbors next door, whatever there is. Finally, knowing what to do sometimes means doing things that we don't necessarily want to do. I want you to think about that because we'd really rather have somebody else do that. I always like Ken to do those things he, that I don't want to do. And John's now taking over from Buddy, and he's the drain man. He has Buddy as a mentor, but he's the brain man. I'm not too good at that, and I'd just soon have him keep doing that. I'll help him. I'll be glad to help him, maybe, at the right time. Now, of course, I'm being facetious to make a point. There are some things that I can't do. I, John talked the other day about being exposed to his daddy being a plumber. He's going to know things I don't. But I can sure can be there to maybe hand him a wrench or something or hold whatever. Or I can hose him off one way, that, so one way or the other. I can spray him down with a deodorant. So um, anyway, there's something, do you get the point? There's some, something we can do, and there's something we can help somebody else to do. And on sermons like this, you can at least say amen. So um, notice what Jesus said, very serious, Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, concerning only what he could do. Only, a Jew, nobody could do this but Jesus. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That says, I know I'm the only one to do it. Nobody else can do it. Now, sometimes that's the way it is. Sometimes I'm the only one or you're the only one in a given situation to do it. Now, the last point is serve. Surely by now we're ready to see that if you've got all the attitude right, you have the spirit of a, of a servant, you know you're to follow Jesus, you know the work of the church, you know the individual involvement, well, just go serve. Go do it. It's not a matter of attitude or knowledge, but simply lack of action on our part. You can study how to pick, let's say, oranges all day long, but you finally just go out there and start pulling them off the tree. And that's the way it is with a lot of things. We need to heed the words of James in James 1, 22 through 25, just a few words in the beginning of this. Be ye doers of the word. That sums it up. Put it into practice. Colossians 3.23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. I'm, I'm making fun of this again, but it's making the point. When John, or whoever it is, is dealing in the sewers, do it as unto the Lord. It's, it's a point to be made. When you're going to visit somebody and they're cantankerous and hateful, do it as unto the Lord. You're not serving a human being. You're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So you do it as unto the Lord. James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. That's a sin of omission. Yes, I ought to do it. I'm a servant and faithful to God. It's part of my work. I don't like it. I'm not going to do it. When I was, how does the Lord look at that? It's sinful. It breaks God's will. Well, we bring it all down to this. There has to be a resolve of heart to get involved in the service one to another. And all things are done decently and in order, and we ought to therefore seek it. To be a servant, what have we learned? We must have the attitude of a servant, the mindset of a servant. 
We have to know what we need to do to serve, and then we get busy about serving. I want to be a servant of the Lord. You ever heard that? I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray. I want to be busy every day in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, and you finish it out. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, know that when you become one and all your sins are remitted, when as a believer you've repented of your sins, confessed your faith in Christ, and are baptized for the remission of sins, that you're raised to walk in newness of life, and that's a new life of a servant. And if you failed in that, then somewhere or the other, or any other sin as a child of God, you need to repent of them and confess them and pray God for forgiveness to find cleansing. But be a worker of the Lord that's faithful to his call. Have the attitude of a servant. Find the thing that you can do and do it with all your might. If you're, surgery, sir, uh, if you're a subject to the Lord's invitation, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing. <laughs>